Gracias a mí, I'm not wise, and I made to to Marcos. Okay. And don't complain about the weather because there is a heat wave on Spain right now. So I believe it's well done. I believe it's welcome in the function. Okay, you plan for a couple of neutrinos. I'm really gonna start from scratch. So if you have never heard about neutrinos before, which is very unlikely, I hope you will learn something. If you are already a neutrino pro, I see you can learn something even from the very first lecture. So let's start. If you look around, and this is the question, you know, my, my plane was delayed again yesterday. So I was thinking, there is this one here. Okay. So why we do neutrinos? Okay. Why we do? If you look around, they are around in other schools. There are no schools on charged electrons. There are no schools on quarks, let alone uptight quarks. Okay. Why there are schools on neutrinos? Dedicated schools on neutrinos, and the reason is because neutrinos are so far, the only evidence of physics before beyond the standard model that we have. It doesn't matter whether you consider your neutrinos Iraq or Majorana, we are gonna see that neutrinos imply physics beyond the standard model. If your neutrinos are Iraq particles, we will see you have to impose lepton number and you have to keep it conserved somehow. This is physics beyond the standard model. Lepton number is an accidental symmetry of the standard model. If, of course, you believe in the are Majorana particles, of course, you have you know, a new case, a new phenomenon associated with this case. So, one way or the other, neutrino means physics beyond the standard model. And beside that, we do neutrinos because they are fun, you know, because they are fun, because they are extremely rewarding. Rewarding is, you know, very subjective thing. But I was able to collect there are five Nobel Prizes associated to neutrinos. Neutrinos indeed shape the way we understand high energy physics today. No other particle collected so much attention about the neutrinos in, in, any, in, any, in any measure you do. So let's begin with that. So next time you face your friend who's doing collider physics, and he tells to you that 10 years ago, 11 years ago, there was the major discovery, the, major, the last major discovery in particle physics, and he's meaning for sure when both Atlas and CMS on 4th of July announced the four sigma evidence, five sigma evidence, of a Higgs in gamma gamma channel, they tell him that he cannot be more wrong. In fact, this year had not one major discovery, but two, and the one related to neutrino was before that, was in May, the other one was in July 4th, and was the diabetic announcement of a reactor mixing angle, of the connecting mixing angle, theta 1, 3, as large as it could see possibly be, and exactly in the same way as we say that the Higgs discovery opened the race for physics beyond the standard model, although, to be honest, we have been looking for physics beyond the standard model since I'm a graduate student, okay? <laughs> so quite some time. This opened its own race that we call it, the experimentalists call it the race for CP violation in the electronic sector. We are seeing that it's also our own race for more physics beyond the standard model, okay? But if we are all working here about neutrinos, where are these neutrinos? We here already they are here, there, and everywhere. We are exactly at these neutrinos, okay? So if you see, if you look around and think that the whole universe is made of electron, protons, and neutrons, look again, okay? Electron, protons, and neutrons are rare objects, are collector objects, okay? For every each of them, the universe contains one billion neutrinos. If this were a democratic universe, everybody will be studying neutrinos, but it's not, you know? Okay, where are all those neutrinos? So in every cubic centimeters of space, you have 360 relic neutrinos from the band. 360 doesn't look much. But if you look, for example, at what I discovered yesterday was Copenhagen most visited touristic attraction, the Little Mermaid statue. You can, in a volume, if I done the numbers right, in the volume equivalent to that of the little mermaid, you have 8 million neutrinos, relic neutrinos from the band. Okay, but these neutrinos really are sitting there doing nothing, just turn motion, so why to care? But these are not the only neutrinos. Passing through each person on Earth, due to the sun, the sun is the most abundant near source of neutrinos we have, you have 10 to the 14 neutrinos per second. OK, 
okay? 10, 100, 300, okay? 10 to the 14 of Rios, you know that the sun shines because the are of the fusion and it's gold. This is the energy that keeps us warm, not as warm here, but in general keeps us warm. Okay, produce elements, hybrid, than hydrogen, and of course produce neutrinos. But nobody here or anywhere uses neutrino screen. So these neutrinos are energetic neutrinos, but we don't shield that. Why we don't shield that from these energetic neutrinos from the sun? Essentially, because this is how you see me. This is how a neutrino sees me. He sees me taller and slender, which is nice, but this is because essentially he does not see. Okay. He needs to see 10 to the 19 people in a row before hitting one match. Okay. And then the energy of the neutrino is. So the mass of the neutrinos so sort that you didn't even notice that. In your lifetime, you will have 20 neutrino interactions in your body. This means that you already have five. And you probably haven't noticed. And you already have 10, come on. And I have never noticed that. Okay? So because neutrinos are very weakly interacting particles. So you were saying, okay, there are tons of them, but they are not relevant for my life, except if you're doing your PhD, but see for your whole life, they are not relevant. No, this is not true. Neutrinos are crucial for our life. If there were no neutrinos, there will be no sun. Of course, the sun would not shine, will be damn cold down here. There will be no elements heavier than hydrogen. There will be no us. So no neutrinos are extremely valuable. But to understand how we got to the point we are and how we learn neutrinos, we see how neutrinos enter into our picture of the standard model of particles. And for that, we need to do a jump backwards in time, approximately 100 years. And we are exactly in the right place because at that time, we have seen this before, Copenhagen was the center of the world, you know? It still is, okay? So at that time, the world was quite different to what is now. You know, the world was emerging from a pandemic. There was a lot of inflation. Probably it's not that different, but in particular <laughs> physics, it was really, really different. Okay. It was really different. If summer schools on particle <laughs> physics existed, they were not one week long. They were very small. In a couple of hours, you are done because there were not that many particles around. And of course, beta decay existed, but was supposed to be a two-body decay. If it's a two-body decay, the energies of the particles involved can be perfectly determined. I'm going to show, I, I have a little corner here. I'm going to show you why, because I'm going to use this thing that you can determine exactly the energy of a particle decaying in a two-body decay analytically in terms of the mass, the passes involved, just with momentum conservation, no more than that. So you know that. The momentum of the neutron is equal to the momentum of the proton plus the momentum of the electron. Okay, you didn't get it here without knowing that. And the momentum of the neutron, I hope you can see this in screen, hopefully. This is the mass of the neutron, zero. The momentum of the proton is just the energy of the electron, the proton, excuse me, P and center of momentum. The energy of the electron is the energy of the electron minus P. So, this minus the momentum of the electron is the momentum of the proton. So you just square it. Then this one is the mass of the proton square. And here you have the momentum of the neutron square minus 2e, e, the momentum of the neutron, plus the energy of the electron square minus the momentum square. But this is again the mass of the electron square. So this means that the energy of the electron is just the momentum of the neutron square plus the momentum of the electron square minus the momentum of the proton square over two times the momentum of the neutron. So you see the energy of the, of the electron can be written exactly in terms, just in terms of the mass of the particles involved, okay? However, this was measured. And it was found not to be a delta as you would expect, but a continuous spectrum. It's even more worrisome than that. The momentum of the emerging proton, the recoil of the nucleus, was not opposite to the momentum of the emitted electron. It was not that energy was not conserved. Momentum was not conserved either. Of course, people thought about the third particle involved into the game, but they didn't find traces of either mass or charge. This is why they started entertaining this idea that maybe energy was not conserved. But 
Okay, don't take these people wrong. We have seen who these people were before. They were not silly people. Okay, we are talking people like Bohr. They just didn't happily assume, okay, you know, she was not concerned, so sad. Okay, no, you have to think where they are. Okay, statistical mechanic was just thriving. So these people didn't think energy was not conserved. They thought energy was not conserved on an event by event basis, but rather on a statistical basis. Okay, this was the idea and how our hero entered into the game. Now we know the universe advanced a lot. So now we know that if your mommy dresses you up in this way, something very dramatic is gonna happen in your life. She didn't know that he's worked from Pauli, as we know, and something very dramatic happened in his life. He proposed the existence of a new particle with neither mass nor charge to restore energy conservation. But as I said, that was then and this is now. At that time, people were not proposing particles like today. You open the archive today, five, 10 particles proposed. This was not the situation 100 years ago. And the community didn't embrace you because you were a big shot. If you propose a particle nobody has seen before, they are just going to to be. People didn't take this particle, didn't accept it, this particle easy. It took another hero and hit and reconfirming. He postulated a theory of beta decay in terms of four component spinners. Okay. These, together with the Fermi and Rodwell rule, allow you to explicitly calculate the energy of the electron emitted in beta decay. This was found to be exactly what people were measuring before. At that point, the community embraced the existence of this hypothetical particle, the neutrino, with neither mass nor charge. But now that we talk about fermions described by four component spinners, it's the first time we have to understand why neutrinos are so different to the rest of the particles, the rest of the fermions in the standard model. We know that the Dirac field is described in terms of four component Dirac spinners. Normally, if you think about the electron, the first are the, the first con two components are the left and the right-handed components of the electron, and the other two are the left and the right-handed components of the process. Now imagine that in my rest frame that I'm standing still, and in my frame of reference, there is an electron moving in the positive Z direction. The projection of its spin along its direction of motion is minus a half. I'm seeing a left-handed particle. Now, one of you who are younger and fitter than me start running in my frame of reference faster than the electron in my frame of reference. So for this person, the electron is moving backwards. He is seeing a right-handed object. And I would ask, with which of the two right-handed objects I have in my spinner, I have to identify what this person is seeing. And you are gonna tell me, Gabriela, this is a very silly question. Look at the electric charge. The electric charge is a Lorentz invariant quantity. So if you look at the electric charge, you will immediately know this person is seeing a right-handed electron and not a right-handed positron. But what would happen if my particle does not have a charge? If my particle does not have a charge, there are several ways out. The first one is you say, okay, I put my particle massless. If it's left handed in one frame of reference, it's left handed in any frame of reference. Problem solved. Not quite. Because it's not for you to choose whether your particle does or does not have a mass. Okay, what would happen if your particle does have a mass? Okay, you have two ways out. The first one, impose a U1 charge. Here you go. But this new charge, and you call it lepton number, five. Okay, but this new charge, unlike the electric charge, does not dictate this symmetry. It's detected by you. There is nothing detected about this charge. You can put it by hand, but who knows, okay? The second, if you do that, if you impose this part, this new one charge, if your particle does have a lepton number, you have a Dirac neutrino, a four-component spin. If you give up and say, well, there is no way, no honest way, whatever honest means, okay? There is no honest way to distinguish between the two left-handed or the two right-handed components of my spinner. So get rid of half of them. Go away with the two-component spinner, a bind spinner. Your particle has become a majorana neutrino. You have only half of the degrees of freedom. Okay, now let's incorporate my neutrino into the standard model. You know, the standard model is based on the gauge group SU3, cross SU2, cross SU1. Neutrinos interact only weakly. So we get rid of all the complications and we end up 
with the only electroweak part, which is broken, as you know, thanks to the Higgs mechanism, to U1 electromagnetic. Under the electroweak group, the left handed components of both up and that type quark are assigned into doublets, while the right handed components of both, again, up and that type quark are assigned into singlets. What happened with the leptons? Well, something not quite different. The left handed components of charged leptons, together with the left handed components of neutrinos, are assigned into doublets exactly in the same way. However, only, are, only the charged leptons are given right handed singlets. There is no right handed singlets, no, excuse me, no U1 singlets for the right handed neutrino. And you are not the consequences of that. The consequence of that is a map term. It's just a left-right interaction. So if you are forbidding a dimension, I mean, you are not giving a right-handed singlet to the, a, a U1 singlet to the right-handed neutrino, you are forbidding a dimension four mass term for the neutrino. And as a consequence of that, your neutrino in the standard model is massless and travels at the speed of light. Also, in the standard model, if neutrinos are massless, remember, helicity and chirality are the same thing. Helicity becomes a good quantum number, only if neutrinos are massless. The standard model teaches us way more than that. The standard model teaches us how neutrinos are absorbed or produced. Neutrinos are absorbed and produced through charge carbon interactions and neutral carbon interactions. In neutral carbon interactions, they are produced in pairs. In charge carbon interactions, they are produced in association with a charged lepton. In the standard model, just with the standard model, we can calculate, explicitly calculate the width of the C boson to any pairs of fermions. This is what you get. Now, if you measure the lifetime of the Z boson, the total width of the Z boson, and you start subtracting the width to all the things that leave a trace on the detector, which is called the visible width, you end up with what is called the invisible width of the Z boson. The width of the Z boson decaying to things do not leave trace on the detector. Now, if you divide this invisible width you have measured to the nominal width to one pair of neutrinos, what you are doing is counting the number of neutrinos that happen to the Z boson in the standard model. This number was happened, was, was measured long ago and was found to be three. And this would mean that if you want to include more neutrinos into the standard model, which we will tomorrow, this will mean that if your neutrinos have massive whose mass is lighter than the mass of the Z boson over two, you better be sure that these neutrinos do not couple to, this, to the Z boson. And this is why we call them sterility. Okay, but the standard model says us way more than that. We think that neutrinos are produced in charge carbon interaction in association with the charged leptons. This means we are gonna name our neutrinos according to the charged lepton they are produced in association with. I have an electron neutrino, I have a muon neutrino, and of course, I have a cow neutrino. Notice also that standard model interactions appear to conserve this U1 charge we were discussing before. If you assign lepton number, a U1 charge to neutrinos and negatively charged lepton on one, and to antineutrinos and positively charged lepton, lepton number minus one, this lepton number seems to be an accidentally conserved symmetry of the standard model. But watch out, in the standard model, individual flavor lepton numbers are also, it's also conserved. It's also a good quantum number, it's an accidental symmetry. However, this is not gonna last more than two slides, so I didn't gonna even mention it. Okay. Notice also that weak interactions are left-handed. This means there is no way in the standard model I can produce right-handed neutrinos or left-handed antineutrinos. I can only produce or detect through standard model interactions left-handed neutrinos and right-handed antineutrinos. But now that I'm talking about left-handed and right-handed, it's a good point to open a parenthesis and start discussing global symmetries for a while because this is going to be very important later. There are three global symmetries in nature, which are parity, time reversal, or charge conjugation. Parity is just a reflected image on a mirror. It's switching the sign of all your space components. Time reversal is playing the movie backwards, switching the sign of your time components. And, and charge conjugation is just flipping the sign of all your quantum numbers, going to parity to antiparity. 
In quantum mechanics and classical electrodynamics, each of them is individually conserved. However, in local relativistic quantum field theories, only the combined product in whatever order you want of them is conserved. This is the famous, I'm gonna talk about this yesterday again, CPT theorem. The CPT theorem says that any local relativistic quantum field theory that preserves Lorentz invariant automatically has CPT built in. And the amazing thing is that under CPT, a left-handed field transform into a right-handed anti-field. This means that CPT-wise, I will be fine with a bile spin or a two-component spin or with only containing a left-handed neutrinos and a right-handed antineutrinos. In fact, I don't need anything else. Okay, this will be more than enough for the standard model. Okay, so, but before leaving, let's look at the pion decay. Okay, this is the pion decay, and these are all the combined symmetries you can do on the pion decay. But there are two questions, and I would like at least to discuss one of these questions with you later this afternoon, or maybe you can discuss it and think it by yourself. The pion decays. 99.99% .99 of the time to a muon and a muon neutrino. However, obviously, phase states means that it should be decaying to electron. Electron is much lighter. Why is decay? It's not decaying to electron, it's decaying to a muon. The mass of the muon is not that different to the mass of the pion. But you already know what it means. If the reason is not phase space, it's not kinematic, it must be dynamics. It is, I mean, nature goes always in the same way. Why is it going into muons? Okay. But before, I mean, just think about it. We can discuss it later. But let's look at the last line. Okay. I don't know. This does not work at all. Okay. If you look at the last line, you see that I'm producing this is just P. So I'm producing there, this my side, a, a right handed anti neutrino. The parity image of that, the parity conjugate is a left handed anti neutrino. So you can see that nowhere in nature. Parity is more violated, it's more obvious parity violation than in a green sector. The one process exists, the reflected image in the mirror of this process does not exist. The reflected image of a mirror of a process is just nothing. Okay. Parity is violated 100% in a green sector. Nowhere else this kind of thing happens. So let's put together what we have learned on the neutrinos in the standard model. There are three neutrinos, and we call these neutrinos in association according to the name they are produced in charge current interactions. So you have an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. This means that as neutrinos are massless in the standard model, chirality is the same as elicity. Elicity is a good quantum number, so I can say that. The anti neutrino has positive elicity, the neutrino has negative elicity, and of course, they are conjugate, CPT conjugates of each other, and they move, neutrinos move at the speed of light. What happens if I want to go beyond the standard model in neutrinos? The first thing you can have ask yourself is if I go beyond the standard model with neutrinos, I give my neutrinos a mass. But then the question is whether mass eigenstates are or are not identical to interaction eigenstates. And why would you even ask that? Because we have seen this happening, okay? Because in the quark sector, we have a CKM matrix. So we already know that mass eigenstates are not always identical to interaction eigenstates, okay? So we can ask whether the same thing that we have already seen happening in the quark sector is happening in neutrinos. So the first question would be, what are the asymptotic states of the Hamiltonian and whether they are or they are not identical to the interacting states? If this happens, we are gonna see that in neutrino physics, we have a phenomenon called neutrino oscillation. And we are gonna discuss why if I say that mass eigenstates are not identical to interaction eigenstates in the case of quarks, nobody ever discussed quark oscillations. Come on, they are not silly either. Okay, there should be a reason why nobody is happy talking. I mean, you top U oscillations could be spectacular. Okay, if they have why they are not happening. Okay, let's discuss that. But let's discuss first neutrino oscillations in two flavors. I'm going to discuss work out in the blackboard. 
oscillations of two flavor. I'm going to explain what happens when you have more than two flavors. Afterwards, I'm going to assume that mass eigenstates are not identical to interaction eigenstates. This means when I have two mass eigenstates and I will have two interaction eigenstates, which I'm going to call nu mu and nu tau. And of course, as this is a two dimensional problem, my mixing matrix is parameterized by only one angle, which I call it theta. But then you can ask yourself again, why if I produce neutrinos of interaction eigenstate and I detect neutrinos of interaction eigenstate, why should I care at all about the mass eigenstates? Why bother? Okay, the problem is the mass eigenstates are the only states you know how to propagate, are the asymptotic states of the Hamiltonian. This means these are the states with evolve with a phase as time goes by. This is the state I know how to evolve. This is why I have to think. Okay, so let's start. We produce this muon neutrino, which is this combination of the first and the second mass eigenstates. And now, as said, I let my neutrino evolve. I let my neutrino propagate, and each mass eigenstate evolve with a phase. And this phase is given by its energy. I'm sorry, I'm using this. I mean, I'm a blackboard person. Okay, so this phase P dot X, this is. E T minus E M, okay, for each particle. This is the phase. Okay, I let my neutrino evolve. Now I want to detect my neutrino. This means I have to switch back to the flavor eigenstate basis. I cannot keep going on with mu one and mu two, and I will do in that way, not with this matrix, with the transpose of that in this way. I hope you will be able to reproduce this calculation for me this afternoon. If not, you can ask, okay? But I will lay out the calculation so that you, it will be very easy for you to, to do that if you haven't done it before. If you have done this exercise before, just keep this exercise and go ahead with it. There are plenty of exercises. Okay, so now I'm gonna feed this combination into the first and the second mass eigenstate. And I'm gonna ask myself, what is the probability of finding a neutrino different to the one I originally produced. I produce a new neutrino. I would like to know what is the probability of finding a tau neutrino. Okay, it's just I need to, to do the bracket between the tau neutrino and the evolved new neutrino. And this is what I get. Okay, this is what I get. But if you look a little bit, I'm gonna assume now that all neutrinos are produced with the same energy. Okay, I can assume they are produced with the same momentum, gonna get exactly the same expression but you can ask and we can discuss i think there is a question on the exercise guide which is the correct description equal mass equal energy or equal momentum the answer is neither both are good enough but none of them is exact okay so if you look at this and you assume your neutrinos are extremely relativistic particles this means that the momentum of a particle is just the energy minus m of the particle square over two well, I'm just taking or expanding this relation you all know. Okay? This relation you get this. This will mean, okay, this is what you get. Okay, this will mean if you look there that the phase get this form. So you can immediately see that both terms have a factor which is common to both and a factor which is unique. The first factor, the one E P minus E A is common to both terms. The other one is unique. But if you factor out a global phase, and I'm taking the absolute value, which is gonna be one. The absolute value of a phase is one. So this factor, the common factor, will die in natural death, okay? And then you end up with this expression. But we can play this game once more of factoring out a global phase, okay? A common phase. What I mean is that you get this, so I'm gonna put e to the i m two square whatever minus e to the i m one square minus whatever. I'm gonna there are more things here. I'm gonna write this down as e to the i m one square plus m two square l over four e. And then here I will have minus m two square minus m one square l over four e minus exactly the same e to the m two square minus and one square L over four. Okay, I will have this and this phase will die again because it's the absolute value of the phase. 
okay, exactly in the same way. If you have any doubt, if you have never done this calculation before, we can do this this afternoon. If you have done it already, okay, good for you. So this is the expression we end up with, okay? This is the frame of expression. And, and the only thing I'm using is I introduce this notation and I call, I call this a kinematic phase, okay? For reasons which are gonna become transparent in two slides. So far, if you haven't noted, I said this to you, we are working with natural units. In units which H bar is equal to C is equal to one. If I want to restore the units, which I will, you have to put the Z and the H in the appropriate places. The exact technicalities are not important. The only important thing is that H, in fact, this is H bar. Okay? H bar comes in the denominator in the kinematic phase. This will mean that when I take the semi-classical limit, which I will, in two slides, this phase will blow, blow up, will go to infinity, okay? So what's going on here? Okay, so let's remind that we said what we have done again, not to get lost on the details. We have produced a mass and flavor eigenstate. We have rotated it back and propagated each mass eigenstate according to the phases, according to its phase, and we have rotated them back to the flavor eigenstate basis to the process, and we have just calculated what is called the appearance probability. The probability of finding an neutrino different to the one I originally produced. I could have calculated as well what is called the survival probability or the disappearance probability. The probability of my new neutrino remaining being a new neutrino. However, I'm working with only two neutrinos. So my new neutrino can either turn into cow neutrino or keep being a new neutrino. It cannot do anything else. This means that the survival probability is just one minus the probability I have calculated before. But let's look at this survival probability in a little bit more of detail. People call this, I'm gonna call this the oscillation length, but it's not important the names or the details. Let's plot this survival probability as a function of the kinematic phase as a whole. Okay, this is what you get as a function of the kinematic phase. Okay, so the first thing you see is that the amplitude of the oscillations are it's not for you to choose. It's given by nature. If nature puts this mixing angle miserably small, then there is no way you are gonna see oscillations. If nature is generous enough to open up the window to see oscillations, then the way you design your experiment, the kinematic phase plays a crucial role. If this window is open and your kinematic phase is essentially zero, is miserably small, oscillations do not have time to develop. And you will see a survival probability of essentially one. If this kinematic phase is in the ballpark of one, let's say between one third and three, okay, between one half and two, you will see a beautiful oscillation pattern. Look at it, it's a beautiful oscillation pattern. However, if this kinematic phase is huge, oscillations are too fast to be resolved experimentally. They get averaged to a half. The sine squares get averaged to a half. And we say that neutrinos behave as effectively in coherent mass eigenstates. Coherence is lost. The interference pattern disappears. We don't talk any longer about neutrino oscillations, but our flavor transition, okay? Coherence loss, meaning we don't talk about amplitudes any longer. We talk about probabilities. We sum probabilities, not amplitudes any longer. And by the way, this is what happens with quarks. In the case of quarks, you never talk about quark oscillations, but about flavor transitions. And this is because quarks are always in the incoherent regime. And you can work out because it's very easy to work out the kinematic phase in the case of quarks. You can do that. But this should ring a bell in your head because you have seen this before. This interference happening, if interference pattern appearing and disappearing. You have seen this before. Remember in your quantum physics or elementary quantum mechanics course, you have seen the Young experiment or the double slit experiment. If you were picking through which window your particle was going, the interference pattern disappeared. If you were not picking, the interference pattern appeared. This is exactly the same. Let's talk about these experiments in the double slit or the young experiment description, okay? I produced a muon neutrino. Now, coherence is lost. I talk about probabilities. 
my new neutrino has a probability cosine square going to the first window and a probability sine square going to the second window. But now I'm picking, so I'm not seeing there is no exchange of flavor between the two Mackaydon states. The, the neutrino who went to the first window has a probability cosine square of keeping of making a new neutrino in the detector. The probability, the neutrino who went to the second window has a probability sine square of making a new neutrino. So the total combined probability is just cosine square, cosine square, cosine to the four plus sine square, sine square, sine to the four. This is exactly the same that you have seen this before. Neutrinos are quantum mechanics at its best, okay? But it is true that as so far I have been discussing my neutrinos plain waves. I mean, isn't this, a, this doesn't sound this fishy? Why would I describe neutrinos as a plain wave? Shouldn't I be describing my neutrinos as a wave pattern? I mean, isn't a bit of a stretch to describe your neutrinos as plane waves? The truth is, yes, it is. Okay, you should be describing your neutrinos as wave packets. And therefore, this is the formalism you should do, where the form factor will depend on exact how the details of your production mechanism is. But if you are more or less good enough and experimentalist, your package will end up being a Gaussian. And even if you are bad, if you produce enough, it's going to be, you know, the large number of theorem beats you. So it's going to be a Gaussian anyway. So this is what you have to do. And technically, what you have to do is to evolve each term, each frequency of your wave packet independently. If you do that, what happens, you would get, you get exactly the same expression. It's amazing, and you can work out in the, the sessions later on this afternoon, how such a lousy approximation as the plane wave approximation works beautifully. Okay, this is the surprising thing. Okay, but in order to get oscillations, we need way more than that. In order to get oscillations, we need co total coherence. Coherence in the production, coherence in the detection, and coherence in the propagation. So far, we have seen only, we have discussed only coherence in the propagation. This is easy to understand. It's easy to understand in the way that if your kinematic phase is huge, this means your neutrinos propagate long distances, wave packets separate. But you need also coherence in the production. What does it mean? It means you need to be sure the uncertainty in the mass is large enough, not to be able to kinematically reconstruct which mass eigenstate is involved there. This will mean that you have to be sure for this framework not to fall apart is that you are producing a flavor eigenstate. You have to be sure you're producing a coherent superposition of mass eigenstates. This means you have to better be sure you are producing a flavor eigenstate. Then the question to discuss would be what happens with non relativistic measurements? Do they oscillate or not? I said that neutrino oscillation is a quantum mechanic effect. Is this related to relativity, special relativity, or not? It'd be my guess. Okay, we can discuss this later on. But I keep doing, and I will do this many, many times, making the connection with the quark, with the quarks. I'm saying always, and I will say that the physics we have here is exactly the same physics in the quarks. And I said that they are, they don't have oscillations because they are always in the incoherent regime. But you have been taught, I'm sure, that quark oscillations are gene suppressed, okay? All flavor transitions are gene suppressed, okay? So why is, uh, they are not gene suppressed here? And we are gonna see that. But before seeing that, okay, with neutrinos, we know we don't have two neutrinos, we have three neutrinos. So the mass matrix is more complicated than that. It's not only that the mass matrix is large, it has more physics in it, and we are gonna see. Now the mass matrix we have has, okay, as in, I, has three neutrinos, so it's three times three, but I'm gonna work as I'm gonna introduce three neutrinos later tomorrow. So we bet I better do it in for n generations and then we are gonna have it done for tomorrow. Okay, so if my mixing matrix is n times n, it has n square parameters. Of course, of these n square parameters, they are not okay, all physical, but of the n square parameters that I have. 
roughly speaking, I have n squared, n times n minus one over two are angles, at n times n plus one over two, these are faces. But as you know, not all the faces are physical. So you can redefine the fields to absorb away all the faces you have. But this will depend on which kind of fields are your neutrinos. If your neutrinos are described by four component Dirac spinors, okay, this means you have in principle two n fields to reabsorb your faces away. However, there is one phase, this global phase, you cannot mess up with because this phase has a meaning, is lepton number. So you can absorb 2n minus 1 phases. At the end of the day, you end up with n squared plus n minus 4n plus 2 over 2. And this is, if you let me put it here, this can be written as s minus 1 times n minus two over two phases. These are the physical phases. And you see that in the case of one generation, you have one phase, which is the Dirac phase, which is the CP phase we have seen appearing in the quark sector, okay? This result, understanding this result, is what got the Nobel Prize for Kobayashi and Maskawa in the case of the CKM. But what would happen if your neutrinos are major nanoparticles? If your neutrinos are Majorana particles, you have half of the degrees of freedom to reabsorb away phases. It is true that you can use them all. You don't care about the global phase, lepton number, because this is an, a symmetry you don't have. This means you have 2n minus 1 phases more if neutrinos are Majorana phases. These are called the Majorana phases. Okay? This is your neutrino is a Majorana particle. These phases are going to appear only in those processes my neutrino is forced to show its Majorana character. Neutrino oscillations is one, not one of these processes. Okay, so if you have three neutrinos, this is the expression you have. And of course, this goes back to the, in the two generation phase, this phase remains is unphysical, the, the Dirac phase is unphysical, and in that with the appearance probability we have calculated before. But let me go back to the question we have, I, I said you before. We said that in the quark sector, flavor changing transitions are gene suppressed. They are also gene suppressed in neutrino physics. Okay? If any of the two mass differences goes to zero, the transition probability disappears. Okay? The fact that I'm able to beat up the gene Suppression does not mean that the same suppression does not exist. We are facing exactly the same physics as in the quark sector, except that we are in a most favorable experimental regime, if you ask me. Okay, so let's look at this appear at the appearance channels and let's look at the kinematic phase. In the best of the worlds, we would like to talk about the mass difference in electron volt squares, the distances in kilometers, and the energies in GeV. So what's the price you have to pay for this mismatch in, in, in units? And the price is not huge, okay? You have to put a 1.27 there. If you think about the kinematic phase, if you include the four, it's just to stick in a five on top of that. So from now on, every time we analyze a neutrino experiment, when we talk about neutrino experiments, we are gonna use the mass difference in electron volt squares, the distances in kilometers, and the energies in GeVs, or alternatively, the distance is in meters, but then the energy is in MEVs. But now that you can come to think about that, you realize that it's not extremely important for analyzing an experiment what the, the baseline is or the energy of the experiment is. The important thing, oscillation wise, is the ratio L over E. And if you look at the experiment, and if you see a oscillation pattern and you know the L over E involved, you immediately know the mass difference involved in this experiment, driving this experiment, because you know the kinematic phase has to be one. Even if you are not seeing an oscillation pattern, but you see a flavor transition, you immediately put a bound on the mass difference involved. With that, we have been doing neutrino experiment for quite some time, for 50 years, we have collected a lot of data. I'm gonna group all the data into three classes. The first one is atmospheric neutrinos or neutrinos from accelerator, neutrinos with L over E is 500 kilometers over GED, which means that they are exploring mass differences of the order of 10 to the minus three electron volt squares. 
then I have solar neutrinos or neutrinos from a reactor, neutrinos whose L over E is 15 kilometers over MeV, or properly speaking, 15,000 meters over MeV. This means they are exploring mass difference of the order of 10 to the minus five electron volts waves. Okay, and then we have all sorts of experiments from solar neutrinos, from accelerators, from reactor, from not neutrino experiments which have not been experimentally confirmed at the five sigma level or where there is a lot of confusion. We are gonna see they are not settled. They are not accepted 100% by the community as evidence, but all this experiment involves mass difference of 0.1 to one electron volt squares. So let's start with atmospheric neutrinos. You know that cosmic rays hit the atmosphere. They, they produce protons, protons produce pions. Pions we have seen, they decay to muons, and muons then decay to electrons. And if you do not distinguish neutrinos from antineutrinos, you should be producing two muon neutrinos for each electron neutrino. However, this ratio was measured in the ancient times by Kamio Kandi experiment, IMB, Sudan 2 in the 80s. And this ratio was not found to be two, but close to one. But the community was clueless, clueless in the sense that we didn't know whether there was a deficit of muon neutrino and excess of electron neutrino. So they delivered the results separately. Okay, they study neutrinos, electron neutrinos and neutrinos neutrinos separately, and they just use the Gauss theorem, the diversion theorem you study in calculus N. Okay, so you know that if the flux is isotropically produced over the air and you don't have inside the air drains or surfaces, the number of neutrinos entering the surface should be exactly identical to the number of neutrinos leaving the surface. Okay, the diversion should be zero. If you apply this to the reactor, the number of neutrinos coming from above your reactor, okay, neutrinos entering the surface, should be exactly identical to the number of neutrinos leaving your surface, coming from below. But this ratio was one for electrons, but was far from one, was close to a half for mu and neutrinos. But again, we were clueless. Ratios do not contain any information, just the global information. We would see how this ratio is distributed. Is distributed in what? Is distributed in the distance traveled by the neutrinos coming through the air to the detector. Okay. And this is the zenith angle distribution. The distribution on the angle the neutrinos obtain with the vertical, which is essentially the distance traveled by the neutrinos. And we have seen that you can see here, nothing happens to the electron neutrino. However, if you look at the end of this plot, half of the neutrinos coming from below are disappearing. You are missing half of the neutrinos coming from below. And of course, we would like to think that this is due to oscillation, oscillation of new neutrinos into tau neutrinos. Why to tau neutrinos and not to electrons? Because we have seen that there are no excess of electron neutrinos. So we know that this must be mu neutrinos oscillating into tau neutrinos with a mass difference of 10 to the minus three and a mixing angle, what we call maximal mixing, which is pi or four, close to pi or four, okay? So why we call pi over four maximal mixing? We don't call pi over four maximal mixing because we cannot go beyond pi over four. You can go beyond pi over four. It's just because remember, the amplitude of the oscillation is given by the sign of two times the mixing angle. So time pi over four is just the mixing angle, the magic number that allows the oscillation probability to take all the values from zero to one. This is why we call it maximal mixing. But so far, I have been kind of cheating, not exactly cheating, but at least misleading, because I show you this plot and said you that half of the neutrinos coming from below are disappearing, and I claim this is due to oscillation. But you can explain this signal away with neutrino decay. Okay, why not? If your neutrino, the neutrino coming from below takes more time to reach the detector because it's traveling more distance. Okay, why this cannot be explained away by neutrino decay? How can I be sure there are oscillations behind this and not neutrino decay or the coherence or whatever phenomenon I want? The only way you will be sure that there are neutrino oscillations behind and here and in any other experiment is when you see the kickback on the regeneration pattern. When you see that the general pattern is increasing again, this is the trademark for oscillations. Before that, don't believe it. Yet, you know? Okay, you don't give a damn unless you see the regeneration pattern. And we have seen this the regeneration pattern long ago, so we are sure neutrinos do oscillate. 
Okay, and we have been doing neutrino experiments for quite some time. And this is the favorite delta M versus the, the mixing angle by the super K experiment and also by deep core. Okay, so all the numbers I'm gonna get from the feeds are given. Amazingly enough, you know that the feeds for mass difference and mixing angles from the neutrino experiments are not obtained by experimentally. They are obtained by phenomenological groups because experimental collaborations only use their own numbers. They never mess up with someone else's data. So it's up to some group of theories to put all the experiments together and do a global analysis. There are two of these strong groups doing global analysis. I'm gonna use the one from the one in Valencia. We are lucky enough, I'm lucky enough, one of the two groups in Valencia, I'm gonna use all the numbers, the numbers you can get them from there. But I have been using so far atmospheric neutrinos, neutrinos I cannot control, so neutrinos triggered by cosmic rays over which I have no control whatsoever. I would like to be sure that I'm getting what I'm getting and I would like to, to narrow down the error bar. This means I want to reproduce this uh, evidence of atmospheric neutrinos with neutrinos I can reproduce. These are GEV neutrinos. GEV neutrinos are very easy to produce when accelerators. So if I try to produce this with accelerator, you see that the problem is that for a mass difference, for GEV neutrinos and a mass difference, of 10 to the minus three electron volt square, this will mean baseline of several hundred to thousand kilometers. But we have done that. We have done that many times. In fact, these are the latest results by T2K. T2K is an experiment. We send neutrinos from the Tokai acceleration complex to come to the super K experiment we have seen before. And this is 235 kilometers. We have the minus experiment. Minus experiment was shut down long ago, is an experiment which sent neutrinos from Fermilab backyard to the Sudan mine in Minnesota, 730 kilometers away. And then the, after that, we did the NOVA experiment. We sent neutrinos again from Fermilab to the Ash River, 110 kilometers away. So we have done that, and you can see that we have narrowed down the error bars a lot, and this is what we know now of atmospheric neutrinos. But let me move and let's talk about solar neutrinos. We produce solar neutrinos. These are the most abundant source of neutrinos. However, if we are gonna make, I'm gonna measure solar neutrinos, I better have an idea how these experiments are done. How we do these experiments? We measure the ratio of observed over expected events. Okay, this is how we do it. So I need to do the calculation of how many neutrinos from the sun I expect. Of okay, course, so there are pro people doing that to make these calculations for a living, but we are gonna do a calculation of the amount of neutrinos we expect from the sun using only Wikipedia. It's amazing the amount of information you can get from Wikipedia. It's really amazing, you know? So we are gonna do this using only Wikipedia and, I'm sorry, what did I do wrong? No, there you are. Whatever I did, it's okay that. So we are, I, I mentioned Wikipedia. You know? So we are gonna do this calculation. This is the reaction, that the most energetic reaction I have in the sun. But the only thing you need to know is that for, it, for, for every 20C, 26 MeV of energy released by the sun, you release also two neutrinos. Okay, this will mean that for every neutrino we get, in the air from the sun, we also get 13 MeV of energy, and this amounts for these 2.2, 10 to the minus 12, whatever joules. Okay, now you go Wikipedia, you tap their total luminosity of the sun, you get some number in watts. Watts, remember, is joule per second. You write this number down. Then you go Wikipedia again. What is the distance from the earth to the, to the sun? Wikipedia no says. You get another number. Okay, so you put the luminosity you have obtained before, divided four pi, the distance of the earth to the sun square, and what you have gotten is the luminosity of the sun at the earth surface. Okay, and this is this number there, and this is done. You know that for each one point, whatever, 2.1, 10 to the minus 12 joules, you are getting one neutrino. For this amount, how many neutrinos you are getting, okay? And you are getting six, six times 10 to the 10 neutrinos per centimeter per second, you know, at the earth. This amounts to 
two neutrinos per cubic centimeter because neutrinos travel, let's finish this one for all, for the, at the speed of light, okay? So this is what you get. In fact, life is a little bit more complicated. You get neutrinos through different reactions, okay? A lot of reactions in the earth. You have neutrinos in the PP reaction, in the PEP, in the beryllium-7 reaction, and the bottom-8 reaction, okay? The important thing is not to know all the reactions, the important thing is to notice that some of these reactions, like the PP reaction or the bottom eight neutrino reaction, they involve three bodies. This means you expect the spectrum to be continuous. Some reactions, PP, beryllium seven neutrinos, involve two bodies. We have seen that that involves two bodies, their neutrinos are monoenergetic. Okay, this is what we are gonna do. Now we let the pros do the calculation and you see that we, we nail it down. We nail it down, you know, you will pay the, at least for the PP neutrinos. So these are the different neutrinos you get according to the different chains they are coming from. And as you can imagine, different experiments on the Earth, they are sensitive, they are different thresholds. They have different sensitivities and therefore they are sensitive to the different type of neutrinos. For example, I'm going to talk about the gallium experiments. They are the most sensitive of all the experiments. They can see sub MeV neutrinos, PP neutrinos. Okay. Borexino is sensitive to beryllium 7 neutrinos, again, sub MeV neutrinos. But the super K experiment, for example, or the snow experiment, they are sensitive to volume neutrinos, a continuous spectrum of very energetic neutrinos, neutrinos above 5 MeVs. So it's, it's important to keep in mind that not every experiment involving solar neutrinos sees the same neutrinos with the same energy spectrum. This is going to be extremely important. So different experiments were done in the Earth over the years, and they expected a different number of neutrinos. These yellow lines, or the lines that start yellow, are the number of neutrinos you expect according to your detector, your particular detector. And the blue line, Beside that, the line that starts blue, is the number of observed neutrinos, okay, in this particular experiment, okay? So you see that different experiments saw different suppressions, but the common feature is none of them saw the 100% of the signal they were expecting. All of them were missing something. And of course, if it worked before, we expect it to work now, we would like to explain this with oscillations. So the first thing you need to, to answer is in which regimes neutrinos from the sun are oscillating? Should I consider amplitude? Should I consider probabilities? I need to know, do I am going to see the oscillation pattern or just the flavor transition? Just look at the kinematic phase. The kinematic phase will tell this all. So we are gonna tell this story backwards, okay? We know a lot. We know that the mass difference 10 to the minus five, the mixing angle of solar neutrinos is pi over six. So we are going to construct the kinematic phase. Okay, this is the kinematic phase. The mass difference is 10 to the minus five. The distance from the Earth to the sun, we, we found this in Wikipedia five minutes ago. And then the energy is one MeV. We put the 1.27, and we see that the kinematic phase is huge. So neutrinos from the sun to the Earth propagate as effectively incoherent mass ion state. This, we should take this into account when now we are going to do the analysis. Okay, so we already know that. So let's start. So we know that the survival probability of my neutrinos would be the fraction of neutrinos produced in the first mass eigen state, or the probability of being produced in the first mass eigen state times cosine squared, plus the probability of neutrinos being produced in the second mass eigen state times sine squared. We have seen this before. We have calculated this before. Okay, so remember that. If my neutrinos were produced in the center of the sun, as if they were produced in vacuum, we have calculated this not even one hour ago, okay? This F1 is cosine squared, and this F2 is sine squared. We calculated this before and even analyzed the experiment, and then the survival probability gets this expression, and it's completely energy independent. It depends only on the mixing angle. And this seems to be okay, seems to be a good description of what, what happens to the PP and the beryllium-7 neutrino, the less energetic neutrinos I have from the sun. There, for the PP and the beryllium-7 neutrino, the survival probability is roughly speaking 60%. This means that they are produced at 70% 
in the first mass eigenstate and 30% in the second mass eigenstate. Fine. What happened with the other neutrinos? In the other neutrinos, we have the snow experiment. Okay, for both main neutrinos, we have super K. Okay, we have super K, but also we have snow experiment. But snow experiment was to some extent a game changer. Why? Snow experiment, snow stand for Salbury Neutrino Observatory, was a very small experiment in Canada. It was one kiloton compared to 50 kilotons of super Kamiokande. The difference is this one kiloton is heavy water. You can have 50 kiloton of heavy water, okay? But with one kiloton of heavy water was enough, okay? Uh, super case water. Why? Because they were able to measure neutrinos not only through neutral current interactions, but with also some charge current interaction. Also electric scattering, but I'm not gonna talk about the electric scattering. Neutral current interaction and charge current interaction. So to some extent, snow was a standalone experiment in the sense that it didn't rely, you don't need any calculation of the solar neutrino flux. If you assume that there are no sterile neutrinos produced in the sun, that all you have from the, come from the sun are acting neutrinos, snow by itself, by measuring the ratio of charge current to neutral current experiment gives you the survival probability. You don't need a flux calculation. And this is why snow completely changed the game, okay? So if you do, if you assume that only two neutrinos are involved, so that they are, you don't need a three neutrino oscillation framework to describe what's going on, that it can be that with only two neutrinos are enough, you can invert using what we have seen so far, the fraction of neutrinos produced in the first mass eigen state and see what's going on with bottom range neutrinos. And what happens is that the fraction of neutrinos produced in the first mass eigen state in the case of bottom main neutrinos is 10%, while the fraction of neutrinos produced in the second mass eigen state is 90%. And the survival probability of these neutrinos is 30%. Remember what was going on with PP and beryllium-7 neutrinos. The survival probability there was 60%, and now the survival probability is 30%. The fraction of neutrinos produced in the second mass eigen state in the in, for low energy neutrinos seems to be 30% and is now 90%. I'm essentially producing one mass eigen state. What's going on here? My so these are neutrinos, okay? Your survival probability cannot depend on who your parents are. This happens in real life, not with elemental particles. <laughs> okay, so what's going on? Okay, maybe and just maybe. Assuming that neutrinos are produced in the very center of the sun, as if they were produced in vacuum, maybe it's not that helpful. Okay, maybe the way neutrinos are produced in the center of in the very dense medium and very hard medium changes their mass difference and mixing angles. What I mean is that the coherent superposition of mass eigen states are produced when I produce my neutrinos in a medium. It's not the same as the coherent superposition of mass eigen states I produce when I produce them in vacuum. And we are going to work out this tomorrow. But before leaving, let me show you this picture. This is a picture of the sun. I know it looks like a very sloppy picture of the sun, but let's put it some context. This picture of the sun was taken at night inside the mine, okay, using neutrinos <laughs> and not photons. And your camera for this is a 50 kiloton water tank. <laughs> when you put this in context, it's an amazingly beautiful picture of the sun. Okay, and we continue tomorrow. <laughs>
And so we do we take that in effect because they could change. It? We haven't taken this into account. We have assumed neutrinos are produced as in vacuum. Tomorrow we are going to produce them in a medium. In a medium is what you call an stable. So far, I have mean this is why I'm getting. I mean, no, so far no. I have only produced neutrinos. Remember, I said that at some point. Let me, let me go here. Okay. So they are you. No, they are you. Okay, they are you. So for me, F1 is cosine square and F2 is sine square. So I'm producing neutrinos as if they were produced in, in the middle of the in vacuum. Tomorrow, I'm going to explicitly calculate what happens if you produce neutrinos in the medium. And this is where the MSW effect will, will emerge. Yeah. Um, I have a, a question to the last slide for an experimental question. Okay, I'm not sure I don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering how do you measure the uh, direction dependence in this picture of the sun in the field? I... Okay, this is okay. Let me, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, you are saying if you're not just coming from below or not just coming from above, this is the direction. No, from the sun. Ah, no, I'm going to discuss this tomorrow. How are you sure whether they are coming from the sun? How do you get the angular resolution and Okay, in fact, you don't, you don't know from where in the sun they are getting. The sun is a point like source for you in your experiment. If this is, but we, we know that we come from the sun. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this not very much tomorrow, but I'm going to mention that we have, we have seen seasonal variations. So we are sure they are coming from the sun, but I cannot confuse them with atmospheric neutrinos because they have three orders of magnitude difference in energy. So I cannot confuse. I measure in, in the same detector, and we are gonna explain this tomorrow. In the same detector in super K, I'm getting neutrinos from the sun. I'm getting atmospheric neutrinos and also neutrinos from accelerator. Okay, so the only ones that in principle could be confused are the ones from the accelerator from atmospheric neutrinos. And this you detect because of the of the energy of the, remember that you never measure a neutrino. You measure the charged lepton my neutrinos are interacting too. And with the charged lepton, I can reconstruct the dimensionality. But again, I mean, if my neutrino, remember this is, I mean, this is general relativity, special relativity, excuse me. This is, if your neutrino is energetic enough, I mean, if the father of your particle is energetic enough, every particle is moving forward and the cone is very, very narrow. So essentially, the electron gets exactly the same direction of the neutrino because every particle is moving forward. You can, it's very easy to do that, to understand that. Get the decay in center of mass and boost it. Boost it with the energy of the parent. And you will see that everything, every alien particle is moving backwards. I'm going to do something along this line as an exercise on Wednesday. So I'm going to boost something and you will see that everything, even particles moving forward, moving backwards, start moving forward in a cone, in a very narrow cone. And the amplitude of the cone is just the, the mass of the particle over the momentum of the particle. Thank you. We have a last question. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a quick question about the velocity. So it's true that I've never heard actually neutrinos are not relativistic. So I don't know. Um, I guess it's not possible to measure them or non-relativistic neutrinos. Yes. What do you mean? It's not possible to measure. So the velocity that they. I mean, I don't know. Most neutrinos that we have usually are uh, really they are close to the speed of light. Don't say this to the Ptolemy experiment because they are targeting that. Don't say this is impossible because you are going to make a lot of people very sad. <laughs> okay. So I'm not sure whether it's possible, but they claim it is. Okay, so let me put, no. we. It's true that I'm going to go this on Wednesday. That is very hard for us to produce. I mean, the way we produce neutrinos, however, Steen is going to talk about that, I hope, at length. The neutrinos standing there from the bank, the, the background of neutrinos, at least one of them is not relativistic. At least one. We don't know how many. So, so we, we don't know the absolute energy. And I'm going to talk about this maybe tomorrow or on Wednesday. But we don't know. But in, in principle, it's kinematic. But my question, if you are asking me, because my question, 
whether non-relativistic, I'm just putting a, a paper question, okay? So I'm not asking you to put a setup. The question is, what happened if you have, just it's a Gedanken experiment, okay? Just get non-relativistic neutrinos. Do they oscillate or not? Design the experiment, no experiment, just put neutrinos, imagine you can detect them. What are they gonna oscillate? Is the oscillation intrinsically related to them being relativistic or is a quantum mechanic phenomenon? If it's just a quantum mechanic phenomena, it shouldn't be related to the fact that they oscillate. There will be a condition under which they are coherently produced. And then, but, but you should be able to work this condition out in, on paper. Then, I mean, these people, the experimentalists are extremely clever. They will find out a way. If you put something on paper, they will find out the way to make it. It's up to you to put it on paper. Okay, maybe this is a good point now to have a copy break. So thank you, Gabriela. <laughs>